item on the agenda is a special presentation. Karen Cranford, will you meet me out front here with any of your family or anybody else you would like to bring up? The whole family. <laughs> That's work family and blood family in <laughs> care. I love it. All right, let's spread out so we get everybody in the picture. <laughs> Karen, thank you for everything you have done for the city. And for our beverage control commission, there's a lot that you've done since we started that store. I mean, it's been very successful. We owe all of you a debt of gratitude for what's been occurring in that store. <clears throat> I want to read a resolution. This is a resolution honoring Karen Cranford. Whereas Karen Cranford, a native of Minnesota, and moved to North Carolina in 1994 and has resided here for over 30 years. And whereas Ms. Cranford attended the University of Minnesota and graduated from Metropolitan State University with a bachelor's degree in accounting. And whereas Ms. Cranford began her career as sales associate for the Albemarle ABC board on October the 28th, 1998, to work in the first ABC store in Albemarle. Ms. Cranford was promoted to assistant store manager and eventually the general manager in fall of 1999. And whereas Ms. Cranford has been an advocate in providing a great selection of products to be available to the public, which in turn created Albemarle ABC store as a destination store, not only for bourbon lovers, but <laughs> for all brands of spirituous liquor due to the selection of product and the barrel picks available to the public. And whereas Ms. Cranford has proudly made $4.4 million in after-profit distributions to the City of Albemarle, in addition to $265,000 for the quarterly 5% law enforcement distribution to the City of Albemarle and the quarterly 7% alcohol education distribution of $304,000 to Safe Kids of Stanley County. And whereas Ms. Cranford is very proud of the team that she has created to make the Albemarle ABC Board successful. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Albemarle expresses its deepest appreciation and gratitude to Karen Cranford for her continuous dedication to the Albemarle ABC Board. Council, I'll entertain a motion to adopt this resolution. So, so moved. Motion by Councilmember Hall, second by Councilmember Aldridge. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Let me get out of the way and take one of their staff. Karen, anything you would like to say? <laughs> I'm just so very proud of this. I appreciate it very much. It has been a lot of hard work, a lot of long hours. So I thank my family, and I especially thank my staff. As there is no I in team, it takes all of us to make mm. things work. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would just like to say that I've been at the ABC store 26 years with Karen ever since we started in Applebar. No one thought it was possible to have an ABC store, but Karen saw fit when she moved here. Never did she know she was destined to have an ABC store in Albemarle. My thing with Karen, Albemarle ABC store, which, you all, which we all know it means al alcohol beverage control. But with Karen, it started out as lowercase, 
A, B, C. With Karen, it grew as uppercase, which to her was awesome, better, and constant. Concentrating on constant means she constantly grew that store to be what it is today. If you walk into Albemarle ABC store, the first thing you would say is, wow, that store reflects her. With her and the board that we have and her team, our store will continue to grow because of the new manager that's coming in, um, Catherine Efer. We will continue her legacy to make sure the Albemarle ABC store is known worldwide and it will continue. We will hold up her legacy because that store meant everything to her and me. And we've been there 26 years and we will still shine in the Albemarle area. The Albemarle ABC store will shine. Remember that. Give Thank me, you. Me <laughs> Sylvia Gaines Bowles. Yep. Thank you. Later. If you indulge me for a few minutes, I just want to take an opportunity because when we first started, it was myself, Doc Kelly, and Don Frey. And Sylvia walked in, we interviewed her. Karen walked in, and when Karen walked in, I knew immediately we had a good opportunity to hire somebody who was of good character. Karen, for 26 years, I haven't met anyone that can meet greet and get um, alcohol in our store the way you have. God bless you. I wish you well, and good luck. My name is Jeffrey Flake, and I've been on the board for 26 years. Thank you. All right. Move on number three, approval of minutes. Council will approve the minutes for October 7th, 2024, regular session, special session, and closed session for consult with attorney, economic development, personnel, and real estate. Move approval. Second. Motion by Council Member Aldridge. Second by Council Member Townsend. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to our public hearings. First one, number 4A, is 2403, is the annexation request for Morgan Hills Phase 3 property. Council, I will, just as a reminder, you first heard of this back when we looked at Phase 1 and Phase 2 and heard about the uh, plans for Phase 3 that would be coming forward. Uh, staff will come up and introduce, and if you have any questions or of him, please do so. Thank you, Mayor. Council members. Open this up real quick here. Um, just so we everybody's on the same page, what we're talking about. Just so we're on the same page, what everybody's talking about here. Um, this is the, um, <coughs> the annexation plat uh, down here. That where I'm circling is the property um, that's being requested for annexation tonight. Uh, this right here, where you see the lots, uh, this is Morgan Hills Phase One. Um, that is completed now. Uh, this over here is Morgan Hills Phase 2, which was annexed in um, about a year or so after this one. Uh, they're beginning work on that phase right now. So this would be Phase 3 down here. Um, this is uh, 77.24 acres, uh, tax record 6462. It's just south of Marlborough Drive and west of Oakhurst Road. Uh, again, here's the uh, aerial uh, of that property. The remainder of um, what I believe was once the, the farmer tract, uh, very large, uh, several hundred acre <coughs> property out there. Uh, this amendment is, uh, the applicant states that this amendment is reasonably necessary to the public health, safety, and general welfare of the city of Albemarle because it places zoning on a piece of property that has been requested to be annexed into the city that will correspond with the current existing zoning and contribute with the tax, <coughs> tax base of the city. Further allowing the community to have more resources and help alleviate all needs of the community for public health, safety, and general welfare by closing this annexation. Uh, currently, the property is vacant. The proposed use is single family units if the city uh, approves an initial zoning of R10, um, which would be subsequent to uh, this agenda item if approved. 
the permitted use in R10 uh, would be uh, around between 160 and about 260 single family units in a cluster subdivision. Water's available on Marlbrook Drive and Oakhurst Road. Power's available from the city of Albemarle. Sewer's available from phase two and runs through the western portion of the par parcel. Um, we did add that switchover of all flow from Morgan Hills should be sent to the new pump station with installation of phase three, as we believe was the agreement um, when the uh, original phases were uh, were annexed. Um, if uh, the uh, Public Utilities Director, Jay Voiles, is here, he can expand on that a little bit as well. Um, phase three would connect to Freeman View Drive, Marlbrook, Highway 52, and Morgan Road. Um, from phase one and phase two with connections to old Aquadale Road and or Highway 52 um, also required prior to subdivision. Some future sub to adjacent properties may also be required. Fire station one is approximately 2.8 miles away, seven minutes. Fire station two is approximately 3.2 miles away or eight minutes. Topography is moderately sloping. Parcel is approximately half cleared and half wooded. Um, and the majority is located is not located in a regulated floodplain. <clears throat> Only a small a small portion of that um, on the far west side would be located in the floodplain. At present, um, it's projected um, approximately 165 units um, of single family homes would be um, constructed. Uh, there would be just over half or just over one mile of new streets, which would yield a long-term annual tax revenue of approximately 4,200 uh, 4, per acre. <clears throat> Put, this would put it in the top 4% of properties for revenues in the city and providing an annual net surplus in revenues to the city of 68,000 or approximately 21% of the total revenues generated from the development. We also included the fiscal impact assessment um, for this property there um, for you to view. Again, here's an aerial uh, of the property. As you can see, um, it's, it's mainly either farmland, fields, um, and or wooded at this time. Here's the current zoning. As you can see, everything in the city surrounding it is R10. Uh, in the county is a little bit of R20 and then RA. To the dark gray, this is the city property um, that um, surrounds the uh, treatment plant. That is uh, zoned HID heavy industrial. Adjacent land, uh, land uses to the north, uh, to the east are single family homes. To the south and the west are undeveloped. Um, you go far enough to the west there, we do have the treatment plant, but that's a good bit, uh, good bit away from this uh, property. <clears throat> the future land use classification on this is uh, county primary and secondary growth area as shown in the tan below. These are areas identified in Stanley County Land Use Plan 2002, updated in 2022 for the 2040 plan for each of the eight cities and towns located within Stanley County where growth and development is encouraged over the next 10 years. And if you will remember, um, the city um, adopted the, um, the, the, the county um, growth areas in its 2028 plan, which is the current plan that we're using. Staff's comments, the, the subject parcel is currently located in Stanley County and is split county zoning designations of RA and R20. Parcel totals 77 acres and is undeveloped. The applicant has requested this parcel be annexed into the city to extend services for residential development with an initial city <coughs> zoning of R10. This is the third phase of the overall development. Uh, in phases one and two, as mentioned, were previously annexed by city council and assigned an initial city zoning of R10. So effectively, it's just extending that neighborhood into the rest of the property. Um, we have the map. We also have the resolution for uh, council's consideration tonight, or the ordinance for council's consideration tonight. Kevin, I want to go back to your lift station. And if you need Jay to come up, ask him to please do so. But if, whenever I understanding when you was here before, and if I understand correctly tonight, we will have to have the new lift station in order to do phase three. Does all of phase two feed into an existing or will part of it go into phase three? Lift I would ask Jay about exactly what's feeding into that. Um, I believe we were going to be able to get um, the first phase <coughs> and part or some of the second phase uh, included in that as well. Is but at Jay some point here? there would need to be a switch over. Jay, Jay is not here tonight. Jay's not here. Not here. Okay. okay. But I understand also the agreement <coughs> is that they were going to construct it. Is that correct? 
that was that was what was agreed upon. Yeah, they would years construct ago the, like the lift station. That's right. Correct. Okay. Council, have any questions, staff? Two things. Just go ahead. Okay. Uh, two questions. Um, <laughs> we talked about fire station one and fire, fire station two having an average response time of seven to eight minutes. What is, I was just curious. What is the average for the national standard? Councilmember Townsend, those are those are drive times. Those aren't necessarily the response times. Okay. Um, those that's are Google drive, drive times, so maybe a little bit less than that. Okay, so that's just to, just to clarify, time. yeah. Okay, and then um, if phase three <clears throat> are projected 165 units, mm -hmm. uh, do, I don't recall exactly how many total units um, comprise phase one and two. I believe it's five. It was 500 and it's five hundred. Five hundred. Five twenty-five. Four ninety. I believe originally it was 525, but 490 is what actually got platted from those two. Ms. Hall? Yeah, thank you. So two follow-ups. One was to the mayor's question about the lift station. So I hate, and I'm looking at the attorney when I ask this. Jay is not here. We believe that the lift station was on the developer. For phase three. For phase three. Right. But no one seems to have that right now in their hands. Rachel, with um, Chambers Engineering is here. Rachel, are you able to answer that question for us, please? Hey, uh, Rachel Carter with Chambers Engineering. Um, I've been the engineer on phase one and two, and I'm here for phase three. We did meet with Jay before ever presenting this to planning and zoning. Uh, all of phase two gravities to Morgan Road, so none will feed into phase three. Phase three and... Um, <coughs> if approved, Windsor Hills would feed into a new pump station and the developer is responsible for installing all new infrastructure to serve that development. So they will be paying for the lift station, the gravity, the force main, all the infrastructure for that development. And Rachel, I hate to, to put you on the spot, but have you seen that in writing with the signature with it? Uh, it's just standard. I mean, it would it would be like the gra you know the gravity they installed the gravity for phase two and phase one water lines. It's what they have to install to serve their homes. Okay, so uh, that would have to be in the plans before they would mm -hmm. be able to move forward. Is that correct, Mr. Robinson? Yeah, a lot of times this is what we'll get into when it comes to civil design. Um, utilities has to approve all that stuff, so they would make sure that goes into the plans at that time yeah, before everything gets design. signed off on. Okay. Because that this because just follow up if you'll come back, Kevin. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, follow up is that this the very first thing that we're doing is not the development itself is actually the annexation. That's correct. And you know I'm still an old school. I don't like talking <laughs> about development until I get the annexation taken care of. So thank you. If you will bring up before us again the map that you had on there, and it's the map that talks about. Oh, there you go. So so that each of us up here. It, I walked. I've walked Morgan Hills, so I. It's a big place. It's a real big if place. I could. It might be helpful for you right there. So Marlboro <laughs> feeds right in it, dead then right now. <laughs> Can you, you got? Have you got a? Um, yeah, you got an era. There you go. This is Marlboro right here. Right. It does. It does. It. It. It's a three-way intersection with Freeman View. Right. Correct. It just sort of stops. That's correct. Right out there. The what looks like it's dirt, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. Is that already in phase two? That is phase two. Um, and that has been that's been approved. So there right. Um, is there more of phase two? I'm just trying to to get a hold on it. Is is there more than that of phase two? <clears throat> Uh, phase two is everything here. They've an, they've annexed this right. in in three different parts. Right. I did. So this was this was annexed in here afterwards. It's it's its own tax parcel right now. Right. Uh, for that reason, um, so it's I don't know the exact boundaries of it here. It doesn't go necessarily all the way to the property line. There's some slope here, and some of this area uh, right. that will be left alone or won't be won't be won't have houses on it. So where's three on that? Three is right here. Now. Pops up on there, but it's it's this parcel right here. So follow up to that would be phase two, not yet developed, not yet deeded individually, is still that one D. Is that correct, or one parcel number? Uh, correct. And yeah. then phase three is that what ninety eight sixty seven ninety eight. 
uh, phase two tax parcel numbers one three nine eight nine seven. It was given a new one. Right. Uh, phase three still has the parent, the original parcel number six four six two. Okay. So originally, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, trying to remember back, six four six two was this entire large piece. Uh, the original there may piece. have been two pieces, but it was it was one or two <clears throat> properties originally, okay. and it was two hundred something acres. Right. So follow up to that would be um, with phase. No, hold on. I won't even ask that because I'm going against what I want to talk about. Which, since we're just talking about annexation, that's all I want. Thank you. Uh, what is that Windsor thing? Uh, Windsor Hills. Windsor Hills is the pre-existing neighborhood right here. How many houses are there? Uh, I I think it's 40, 40 something. There's several. There's a few more lots that aren't developed, but I think it's it's 40, 45 or 50 lots total. How many? Like a total of 58. 58, okay, thank you. It's an establishment. It's an older yeah, it's an neighborhood. Older yeah. It's neighborhood. an older neighborhood. Morgan Hills and Windsor. We're going to have several <laughs> hundred houses in that one place. That's correct, yeah. And, and Windsor Hills is, is an old established neighborhood. I, I don't know if, if this is in, in order or not, but my understanding is we have right at 4,000 units that have been approved in the city right now is that right that's correct roundabout and 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 we're asking <clears throat> for another 100 200 or more is there do we run the risk of having a whole bunch of developments that are a third to a half filled uh councilman bramlett i, I think um, i mean it's very likely it's very common um, that you will get um, developments approved and property annexed in, and it won't, they, for whatever reason, they won't end up going all the way through with development on those. So um, while that 3,500 or 4,000, whatever it is now, is, is large, um, I don't think we're going to see all that being built overnight. We will see a lot, but I don't think we're going to see all that built overnight. Um, a lot of these, if they hang around for several years, they will end up having to come back and be reapproved, and they may change later on. I, I, I don't know about Fred. I'm having a lot of people hit me that we're getting a lot of developments with a whole bunch of houses just put, put together, uh, crowded and that sort of thing. And I, I don't know if that if that's good for us. I, I, I know I want, I want housing in the cities. Mm -hmm. I, I like what the county has done. But, so I'd, I'd prefer to have our, our housing and people living in the cities. But but four thousand units in a city that only has sixteen thousand people, that that just seems out of whack to me for some reason or another. And those are those are I mean obviously we've got a lot of different types that are coming in. The cluster yeah. development yeah. is very common, but um, those those housing units those numbers do include apartments and some other things that have been that have been brought in as well. So it's a it's a mix. We do have some larger lots, not as many of them, but some larger lots. Uh, subdivisions that were approved as well. So it'll be a mix of all of those. Well, and I'll just, Mayor, if I may, I'll just add, you know, to Dr. Bramlett's point, you know, the, the concern that I have or the, the, what I hear constituents reaching out to me about is, do we have the infrastructure? You know, and, and um, you know, when you think about 165 homes, if you, if you average four people per house, that's, uh, that's about 660 residents, and uh, do we have the police? Do we have the fire? Do we have the schools to support? I like Dr. Bramlett. I'm all about smart growth, but smart growth. Um, we've got roughly 4,000 homes sites approved. If two or three of those developers start moving dirt in the same couple months, uh, do we have enough? Do we have schools to support it? Do we have enough fire? Do we have enough police? I know we have water. We have power. I get that, but. At the end of the day, do we have the essentials we need to support this type of a subdivision? And I, you know, I, the you know, city manager wants to jump in on that on how we handle all that. Uh, typically, these houses are going to come on a little bit at a time, um, and we should be catching up with that in tax revenue every year, so that we are able to <coughs> hire and, and add on um, as needed. That's what I was going to say to Bill's point: is that you kind of got to grow it along as the growth comes the revenue increases so that you can add we know that over in that area somewhere before too long there's probably going to add another fire department that's been talked about so 
as that area grows, the tax property tax revenue, sales tax revenue will grow enough to be sufficient to be able to support that. Um, and I think a key point of that, not to get too much off topic here, but the, the future <laughs> land use plan that we're, we're working on right now, that's yeah. we're, we're working with the fire department on that. We're going to bring them in very frequently on those discussions to discuss location of where those might be, where do we want to grow, and trying to stay ahead of that in the future. And I hate to do this to you, but I, like Marcus, said, I don't <laughs> like to put the cart before the horse. However, my biggest concern over there is the distance between homes. They're 15 feet. Is that going to translate into the 77 acres as well? Or are we, are we too far? We're not far enough along with that. So let's, let's let's hold just a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll get in the zone. I, I, yeah, we're, I'm concerned I understand. about yeah. that, Mayor. And and one of the things that your council has got to decide, and we've talked several times, as they're going through this land use plan, do you want to change that? Because that is what we approved yeah. in the past, and that is what's been approved for this for this area. But I think if you're getting into how you're going to zone it, we need to hold to after the annexation. I understand, but I I just want to make it known that. That's not acceptable for me in this neighborhood because I live there and I hear the neighbors. I can look out my back door and see Morgan Hills, mm -hmm. and that's not a big issue. I've walked that place for the last three or four weeks, uh, and even before that. So uh, I just want to make that clear of where I stand, whether I'm here or not. I just want to make that clear. And so, council, the council will have this, the decision to make what, how you want to zone it. Yeah. If you if you're annexed, sure. you have the choice. If you want to go with zoning, what right. zoning you want to use. Any other, more questions for Kevin? Not, and we'll move on to the other people that have signed up to speak. On the annexation <coughs> issue. Yeah. All right. First one I've got signed up to speak, and this is a public <coughs> hearing, so I'll open it later to the floor. <coughs> Kim Faulkner, 555 Marlbrook Drive. <coughs> Good evening. Um, uh, I live in Windsor Hill, and um, Miss Faulkner, will, will you speak a little bit closer, please? I, can, <coughs> I sure can. Thank you. How's that? Perfect. Good. Um, like I said, I I live in Windsor Hills. I've been before council three or four years ago when this development got started and was opposed because y'all opened uh, or allowed um, our street, Marlbrook Drive, to be put into this development. Instead, for years, we've been out there 30-something years, Marlbrook Drive was the end of the road. It was heavily wooded. We could have never foreseen something like this would come up in our backyard. But but it did, and and that's why I came and spoke. So all that's done and over with. Uh, now I want to tell you what what it's like to live there. Um, over the last three years, we have endured fire smoke from them clearing the land and burning the timber and stuff that they couldn't use. Dust clouds from no vegetation, no trees, no nothing but dirt and dust. Water runoff from berms and the street has no drainage in the street that comes into Marlbrook. It comes right <coughs> through our yard now. Just, that's just poor drainage and poor planning. Loud construction equipment day in and day out. Sunday is the only day we get any peace in our neighborhood. Delivery trucks that have backed into our front yard making deliveries over there using Marlbrook Drive instead of all the streets that come into the development, they come in Marlbrook because it's easier to get over there. They don't have to 
um, get around all the cars and stuff that's sitting on the side of the road in this development. And we've had to go out there and make sure that trucks stay out of our front yard. And this is just completing, almost completing phase one and fixing to go into phase two. It's going to be more and probably more than I could even imagine. <clears throat> um, we feel, and we is me and my husband, that the developer has not been a good neighbor to our Windsor Hills neighborhood. Its employees speed up and down our streets. The construction and and the construction areas are loaded with trash. <coughs> and that blows into our neighborhood. There's litter everywhere. And then we have other concerns that back when this first got started, there was a traffic study that was done and it revealed that it would be recommended for Morgan Road to have an extra lane of traffic that comes out where Morgan Road and 52 intersect to have a, a right lane turning and a left lane turning. And that hasn't happened. And the study also revealed that people leaving the Morgan Hills, on Ro Morgan Hills Road coming out to Cobol Avenue, there should be an extra turn lane there to get onto Highway 2427. So that hasn't happened either. Ms. Faulkner, I want to give you about 30 seconds to wrap up. We're past the three-minute time limit. Okay, I wasn't aware we had time limits. But anyway, that, that is still a concern. So as a taxpayer and a resident of Marlbrook uh, Drive, we're asking City Council to consider not moving forward with Phase 3 until some of these issues can be looked at by City Council and subsequent departments and be resolved or addressed and you know we need to hold this developer accountable for stuff going on there's a whole lot more than obviously i can say so we also have some concerns about they just mentioned the sewer you know we had our own sewer system sewer easement runs right by my house and I just heard somebody mention something about the Windsor Hills sewer system. So obviously that's going to be a concern of ours if that's going to be changed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Faulkner. Next is Bernie Carver, 36323 Oakhurst Road. Yes, I live at the dead end of Oakhurst Road. I wonder how far that coming up behind my, my house right there. You know, and you have, and if there's going to be a, any way to get into it. Are you asking that as a question? Yes. Uh, I don't know that I Kevin, is there, we haven't seen any design yet, have we? No, I, I just want to know, that, is that going Oakhurst? to annex all that in behind me? Show him, show him on that map right there where you live, sir. <laughs> what is I live at the very dead end of it. Right there? Yeah. yeah. And all that, there's a road that goes, well. This, this is part of it. I mean, they're not going to touch your property, but there's a property. Well, well, right well we, be, we won't have to be an annexed in the no, city, will we? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I just want to know, that's for, that's, I want to know how far it's going to come up to my house. You know, if you wanted to be annexed, you would have to request. No, it. I do not want to be annexed. <laughs> I'm not paying city and county taxes. You got a good answer tonight. That's, a good answer. So, I, that's the main thing I wanted yes, to know. Sir. So, <laughs> Thank you, sir. I Thank wanna, you. I just, I know I'm going to regret it when they start building it in there, or all that racket, because I'm still hearing from my house all the way over there, and you know, and. Early in the morning, I get up in the morning here banging and going on over there, and, and it's not easy to you know to rest. And yeah, you know, like I say on Sunday, it's about the only time you 
you don't hear them. So. Thank you. Yes, Thank sir. you, sir. This is a public hearing. Anyone who cares to speak for or against, please come forward. Motion to close public hearing. Second. A motion to close the public hearing by Councilmember Townsend. Second by Councilmember Aldridge. Further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Council, do you have the information you need to t discuss further tonight, or what would you like to do? I just have a question. Is the developer here, Kevin? Anybody on behalf of the developer? <coughs> Rachel's here on behalf of the developer. Okay, thank you. Council, how you wish to proceed? I would go ahead and make a motion. We approve Ordinance 2438. I have a motion by Councilmember Whitley to approve Ordinance 2403. Oh, three. Oh, three. I'm sorry. Oh, three. Oh, three. Okay. Motion by Councilmember yeah. Whitley. Second. Second by Councilmember Townsend. Further discussion? Mayor, I, I just, I've got to say this. <coughs> For years, I have been a proponent of strong development in our city, of opening up houses, whatever we can do, make make it bigger and that sort of thing. But I remember when I was in business in Concord, the economic development director told me uh, at one time that his job was to provide a family support job for every new house that came in. And a lot of those new houses coming in over there were people working in Charlotte and so forth. But he said in order to make it right that Cabarrus County needed a, a family support job to offset that. I can't see where we're going to get family support jobs. I cannot imagine what these people are going to be doing. Now, I, I know they're going to commute to Charlotte and all that sort of thing. But when we're talking of 4,000 <coughs> It just doesn't make any sense to me. And and I I can tell you this, unless something changes in my life, I'm going to be more for better, stronger development than just numbers. I want good development in our city. And I I just, with 4,000 hanging, I just don't see this as a, as a step forward for us. Further comments? Uh I just would remind folks that this is not the development. This is the ad, this that's well, before they're, they're, us. They're, it's a package deal. No, this is the annexation. This is the annexation to begin with. Uh, we don't. We can then make the decision on how we're going to zone it. So what we're talking about now is the annexation. Further comment. All those in favor, raise your hand. Four four. Those opposed? Four, three. Okay. It has been annexed, so now we will go into the zoning. 4B, Zoning Map Amendment 2410, Zoning Map Amendment request to rezone Morgan Hills Phase 3. And Kevin, would you start by telling the options or the end of your presentation of, of how they can zone, of what they can zone and what they can and can't do according to our current ordinances? Um, and before he starts that, Mayor, will he talk about when these current ordinances were passed into to our ordinances? Because this sitting board, if I remember, <laughs> this sitting board made those particular, um, that ordinance. And we've just updated those numbers <laughs> of houses and that size acreage. If you can do that, I think that would set things, set some okay. information as well. Yeah, we have... Um... We have, I believe, six different um, residential zoning categories, which is, is a fair amount uh, for a city our size. Um, we have the um, uh, R4, which is a, a kind of neo-traditional, uh, very dense uh, development. That's a conditional uh, zoning. I think you guys saw one of those um, a few months back. Uh, RO and R6, which are relatively the same thing. Uh, with a few differences. Uh, one allows office, uh, but those allow for multifamily. Um, uh, 
townhomes, duplexes, very small lots. Um, R8, which is kind of uh, the middle of the road, those are uh, 8,000 minimum square foot lots, um, does allow for townhomes as well. Uh, R10, which is really the predominant um, zoning district um, the city is zoned for. Um, I, I don't even know, it's it's probably 50% at least that zoned R10. Um, and that's, um, there's been some small changes to that, but that's by and large uh, remained the same as it has been um, over the years. Um, so that is our, our most uh, common one. And we do have R15 um, that was really uh, developed for the, um, for the, the east side of town, for the watershed area over there to address some of those. Um, R15 also allows in uh, mobile homes uh, as well, since those are slightly larger lots. Um, that's the primary difference of that. Explain cluster. Um, so clustering um, is you're, you get the same number of lots that you um, were able to have uh, under the regular zoning, but you can reduce the lot size by up to 50%. Um, the remainder of that land, um, any lot that is uh, less than that, um, you have to take the remainder of that property and has to go towards your open space. Uh, that's why you see most of these uh, cluster subdivisions coming in with a lot of open space, a lot of amenities, uh, those types of things. That's the trade-off uh, for doing the cluster um, subdivision. Um, that's done at the time of subdivision, though. It's really it's a administrative thing whether the um, developer wants to go with that or a standard uh, standard um, subdivision. So you're telling me council can adopt R10 without cluster? No, cluster cluster can be applied in our ordinance right now. Can be applied to any zoning district um, for residential. Um, properties. And if you'll remember, um, one of the big differences, um, what you see right now, I, I would clarify, um, when we first did Morgan Hills, it was one of the first subdivisions, major subdivisions that we, the city had seen. Um, the cluster subdivision at the time was really wide open. Um, it, it didn't really, um, it, it required uh, open space uh, to be made up for, for reductions, but it didn't Put a cap on how much a lot can be reduced. Uh, we've got some some lots that are like 3,400 square feet in there right now because that's what the ordinance allowed. Uh, before phase two was done, we changed our ordinance to require that if you cluster, you cannot reduce by more than 50 percent. So the minimum lot size there will be 5,000. Most of those are over that. They're around 6,000 or so. Um, this would be similar to that um, that phase two. Um, they would not be the size that you see in uh, Morgan Hills phase one right now. Um, same thing on side setbacks. You can still get some very close lots, uh, but some of those do have setbacks that are like four feet, I think, or even a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, in between the homes, it's only like eight feet. So, I mean, you would have to have a minimum of 10 feet between right now, um, probably probably more than that ultimately once it's done. Yeah, yeah I would. The minimum would right now. That the, we could see more expanse between homes. Yeah. It's, it's frightening to me. Yeah. And if council did R15, how would cluster work? Uh, it would be the same way. Um, they would be, you would not be able to have as many uh, units there. I don't know how that would affect the development. Um, you wouldn't have as many units. Um, um, in theory, you could probably get close to what they want, but I'm not sure how with the size that would affect it. 50% uh, of those would be 7,500 minimum. Um, setbacks really, I think, setbacks aren't a whole lot more. I think you'd have six, minimum of six instead of five or 10 to 12. So, so we're really not gaining anything. You, not a whole lot, really. Um, if, if that's a concern is the setbacks on those, then we ought to take a look at the cluster ordinance and probably a, a, you know, address how much can be reduced there. But keep in mind, right now, standard across the board uh, in most of our districts, it's you know between eight and twelve foot setbacks almost almost across the board. So, um, just just dovetailing on Council Member Bramlett, that we're going to continue to see developers coming in. We're going to continue to see uh, land evaporate. <coughs> and housing coming in, I'd like, personally, I'd like to take a look at, at the clustering that you just mentioned and how that could play into 
not the number of houses, but the quality of what we would have for the people that are making those investments and not being one right on top of the other. I mean, it, if you don't know what it looks like, just go over to Morgan Hills and walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, not much more than, you know, trying to shoot a basketball at 10 feet. And uh, it's, 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 it's real close. But I think they're already getting started. In, in, in number two already. They are. And like I said, those lots will be, um, uh, mo for the most part, some of them, some of them in, in um, phase one are a little bit larger, um, but they're not the norm. Yeah. The ones on the end of the cul-de-sac, the ones in the corners are larger lots, uh, but most of them are less than 5,000 square feet. Um, like I said, some of them I think are like 3,400, mm -hmm. which is very small for a single family oh, lot. Good Lord, um, yeah. Yeah, so this goes back a little bit about what I've mentioned a couple of times before, that yeah. during this land use plan process, right. we yep. need to be looking at some R20s, I think R30s and R40s. I Me think too. we need to have more options. So I agree. The council has more options to do. Kevin, can there be a development agreement in, in this consideration? I think that's probably between um, the developer and council. Uh, that's, they haven't requested one, so I don't, I don't know. I'm a little disappointed that they're not here this evening to so council could delay any decision and see if they were in willing to enter into an agreement for some kind of a some kind of a development agreement that changes the how close the houses are together uh, council can certainly delay the um, their decision on this if, if they want to I defer to our attorney when it comes Mayor, to the development agreement. Because sir. it's already been annexed, it needs a zoning classification. Yeah. Um, so even if you come up with a classification tonight and normally the developer would run with what they would get tonight, the development agreement normally precludes um, annexation and zoning. If you remember in the past, we did the development agreement annexation and rezoning in the same night. So it would be a little rare to do the development agreement on the back end because once you give them the zoning classification, that gives them the rights to whatever is included in that classification. I really think that the timing of the, the committee that's just been established rewriting our plan, um, again, if we were a year into it, we would already be into that. We got off, we got started late we would be, these are the questions I think that we would not be dealing with right now. So, but we are finding ourselves where we are and we got to do something. Yeah. But yeah, we've got to give it some zoning. But more the, more the reason to get the plan updated that you're working on, Kevin, and I just am very glad we got that committee established because it's, we definitely are in need for that. I agree with the mayor that in the future, the writing of it, that we need to expand it. <laughs> Because I too have been over there, and it is—they are very close. Very it's phase close. one. Phase one. Yeah. Phase two has nothing out there yet. Uh, <clears throat> How much larger did you say? Roughly, the lots would be in phase three and two after the ordinance change. Um, Seventy-five hundred would be the minimum they could reduce to there. So that's fifty percent more than, than what 50 they got. Percent yeah. larger than what they could do what, before. What are they? What are they oh, because there's small. Well, uh, according to Rachel, most of the lots right now are proposed at 10,000 square feet, but that's not something we can guarantee at this point with zoning. But you said the minimum would be 7,500. In in um, in R15, if you did a cluster, the minimum would be 7,500. I'm saying that. Um, she said that right now the 10,000 is the minimum that they're proposing in the R10. Um, but as I mentioned, that's not, and they're doing that so they do not have to add as much open space um, into the uh, development. Um, that's not something that I can guarantee at this time. Right. Without a development agreement, we can't require that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, 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 uh, development agreement is, is a possibility. Um, it, I'd, I'd want to be real careful about, you know, uh, trying to use that tool too much. Ms. Um, I think, um, as I previously stated, normally the development agreement precludes the annexation request and the um, rezoning. We would bring all those three together tonight. 
Um, so it's, it's going to be difficult to give them a zoning classification and then go back and say, well, we want to right. negotiate kind of after the fact of the approval. So I don't think that that is um, something that we can do now. Obviously, I heard Ms. Rachel say maybe 10000 minimum, but obviously what Kevin said, that's not anything that we can guarantee at this time. So we can only go by what the ordinance requires and these zoning classifications that are available to us tonight. Come on up, Ray. <coughs> what what were you asking for? What what would you be looking for in a development development agreement? <coughs> Size lots. Size lots or separation? Separation. Yes, both. So I will say the topography is the worst on phase three. Um, there's several jurisdictional streams. There's the creek that runs past the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and we are limited by the TIA to 595 lots. Um, Kevin already said we have, I think, 420 between, between phase one and two. Um, the maximum we could have, according to the TIA, is 595 across all three phases. Um, and I think right now we're looking at about 160 just because the land is tough. Um, because the land is so steep, it is hard to find area that we can take away from a lot, but then put it back into an improved open space area for the residents. So we have tried to extend the lots as much as possible because we can't we cannot put it back into a usable open space. It's it's unusable open space. Um, we'll still meet any open space requirements, you know, if condition or um, cluster or by right. Um, but that's the reason for the larger lot size. And I think you'll see phase one, two was also a conditional use permit. It wasn't by right, which I wasn't here on the zoning on that, but phase two lots are a lot larger um, than phase one and phase three is even larger because of the topography. So for what that's worth. Um, Do that one more time. I think that's, I think that's of importance. Okay. Because all that anybody sees right now are the, 250 or whatever houses there are in phase right. one. And it's conditional on use. Size. Right. Conditional use this size. Yeah. Two is about this way. Yeah. I mean, it's larger. And the, even the developer, um, they re specifically requested larger lots in phase two because it was so difficult for the builders in phase one. So. <coughs> this is a. Go ahead. Now, let's see if there's anybody else. Mayor, I don't think I need to go through too much of this, but just for um, the sake of the meeting and everything, um, I just wanted to um, give a quick summary on this again. Um, this is vacant land. Um, it is surrounded by R10. Um, I think I've covered the rest of that already. Um, I have requested R10 and um, the... Um, Staff believes there are merits to this rezoning, um, and at its re regularly scheduled meeting on October 3rd, Planning and Zoning Board uh, voted 8-0 to zero to recommend council approval of the initial zoning. Um, they also recommended a consistency statement, which is included here. This is a public hearing. Anyone who cares to speak for or against, please come forward. Move to close the public hearing. Motion by Council Member Alders close to public hearing. Second. Second by Council Member Dry. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Council, <coughs> open for discussion. Mr. Mayor, given the discussions that we've just had, I would be in favor of holding this for a little bit till we can get more information with regard to what the builder can do with the clustering and with the the, the footage. But I think we've got to give it a zone tonight. That's the problem. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Isn't that right? We've got yes, to. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Yeah. We've got to okay. give it a, So what is the possibility? I see what you said, and I see that the plane and, plane and zoning says R10. <clears throat> okay, I see that. Right. If we wanted to go R15, <laughs> that in itself, says the minimum lot would be 15,000. Is that not correct? Uh, minimum lot size um, outside of a cluster is 15,000 with that. 
Um, it's 7,500 uh, in a cluster um, and allows for, um, it does not allow for duplex. It does allow for single family homes and manufactured homes. That's the main difference uh, between the two. But between what are we two. gathering size wise? If you can do R10 cluster and R15 cluster, what's really going to be the difference? Uh, it's like 2,500 square feet or whatever. So you on would the get 2,500. <laughs> you would. <clears throat> on um, 15, as I understand it. But when you do cluster, you don't have to do the. Yeah, but on cluster, instead, to... well, on cluster, as I understand it, it would be 7,500 because you have to do 50% of what it is. Mm -hmm. So we're still getting more. I mean, the, the the lot size is still have to be larger in a 15, even at 50% in a cluster. Is that not correct, Kevin? He didn't understand. The, the lot size still has to be 50%. Right, but what I'm saying is, in 15, it's 15,000 square foot. On a and standard it, On a standard. standard zoning, with a correct. cluster, it's up 50% of that. Right. So we're still doing more right at 7,500 than we are right now. Yes, sir. Your Honor, based on the October 3rd Planning and Zoning Board unanimous vote of 8 to nothing, if th this thing as written right now at R10, that basically... Uh, that's basically what's over there now in phase one, correct? R10. That's, that's correct. R10 is what's over right. pretty much the whole area um, and, and most of the city. Okay. Well, Bill, so if this phase, were to be approved, just one. like it's, so if this were to be approved, just like it's written here, the additional phase would look just like the first phase, correct? No. Uh, n no, there, there were some changes to the cluster ordinance that would be applied. Uh, previously, that 50% was not there. You could reduce a lot size as far as you wanted it to. Um, and that was something we discovered when that first phase came in. Um, we pulled up the ordinance, looked at it with the developer, and they're correct. There wasn't anything um, limiting the um, limiting that. And then there was also the, the, some of the open space requirements were not really there. Uh, the active use amenities, those types of things. So we added all that in um, to, the, uh, to the ordinance at that time. Um, so those are smaller. Those are sub- 50%, some of them are 30, you know, 30, 34% of the, of the required size. Um, these would have to be a minimum of 50% of the, of the required lot size. Thank you. So basically R10, they're going to be 5,000, R15, they're going to be 7,500. But also what I heard from Rachel on behalf of the developer is, is that because of the topography of the land and because of, Three, I mean, two we've already seen is different than one, and there, it won't be as much. And three is even harder to deal with. Is that right? Is that Rachel? So, I mean, it's not going to be as as jammed together on any condition at two nor three, but three is what's before us right now. I'm of the opinion that even though I mean, I love planning board said R10, I would be okay with R. I mean, not R15, but um, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with R15. I mean, anything that we can do <coughs> to create a little more space, I mean, Lord knows, you know, the fire department's 2.8 miles away, houses 15 feet apart that are wood and vinyl. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you can deduct what you want to there. But I, anything that would expand it, that, that to me is the most important thing that we can do for the safety of the people and the betterment of the housing here in Albemarle. I'll entertain and a motion. I, and I would make that motion, Your Honor. Motion by Council Member Dry to approve R15. Is that with the consistency statement? Absolutely. And wasn't there another part of that uh, statement as well? Uh, reasonable is reasonable. Yeah, that's in the consistency statement. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I <coughs> that too. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by, second by Council Member Hall. Further discussion? So we we modifying the developer's request from R10 to R15. Correct. Okay. Which should make no difference to them at all if they're planning on building 10. Well, if they're 10,000 and we reduce them to, we've reduced them in R15 by 5,000 square feet. So we'll have to add 5,000 square feet to their 2,500 square feet to the active open space. That's what the ordinance says. So they will probably have less lots. I don't. I would have to go back and look, but they're instead of being full size, they would be reduced in R15. So okay. I'm okay with less lots. So yeah. So just a question: 
what would happen if we somehow, um, if it didn't pass on the R15, but the developer already went through the process, through the planning board and everything, would we have to come back at their request and take a vote on the R10? I think if it doesn't pass at 15, Brett's going to ask you if there's any other options tonight. She, she would like to have it on something tonight, my understanding. It, it, it needs its own classification tonight. And I will say that planning board's recommendation is just that. It's just a suggestion. So council has the final authority. So long as there's been a public hearing that there is tonight, we do have the discretion in the zoning classification without having to um, send it back to the planning board for additional review of the R15. So I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 160D gave some time periods on initial zoning. Is that that's isn't that correct? I'm not familiar with that. I, it would be hard to have that, a property in it with right. a classification I, for a, a, a kind of a uncertain amount of time. Right. Yeah. That's We've not. That's why that. we try to line them up like that. Um, All right. I have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. All right, let me let me see that again. Now, I got it through. All of all of favor. You get rid of state of, of our fifteen. Raise your hand. Okay, four. All opposed. Three, four, three. Okay. Most another carries. another comment would be if the developer comes back with a development plan and there's some issue that makes sense, we could always revisit the zone, right? Say he, say the we want developer wanted, could request a zoning amendment. Yes. And that that point, so we, we could con process. we can consider a development agreement. If the developer wants to come back and request a rezoning, um, there could be a potential to entertain something at that time. Yes. That's I'm just, you know, trying to foresee if there was some issue we're not aware of, and you know, they might it might make sense to do that. So okay. So follow up to the attorney on that. Then, I mean, would that be in the in the regards to a special use permit, or no, just a just a just a change. Just a general um, rezoning. I'll have to take a look at the ordinance to see if there's any time frame on when they can come back. I'm not sure if Kevin knows off the top of his head. If they if they're changing the zoning for a specific, they can come back. I believe if it's a new zoning, you can't come back for the same zoning unless there's been a substantial change. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right. If, if it were denied, if a rezoning was denied. They could not come back for the same zoning for like a year or something like that in the by statute, I believe. Thank you. So, so Mayor, just for clarification, we know that if we annex it tonight, we had to give it a zoning, and we had members of council who did not support the largest one that we could put on it. I mean, what? And I just, I mean, we know legally, we heard Britt say we had to give it a zone. Right, Britt? Right. We had to do that tonight. And so we were, I, th I thought we were being as lenient as we could be to, my, to the folks that didn't support. I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm trying to figure out, if well, we heard the attorney say we had to give it a zoning, then what could we have done differently? Except as it was presented. Or do what we just done. Well, but I think if, if he couldn't agree on the zoning, what would what would happen? I mean, All right, let's, but, let's 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 yeah, move on. But I just I guess I've got to moving on to announced delegations. Six <clears throat> A fiscal year 23-24 audit report of the Admiral Business System ABC System. Durham Lewis going to make that report. Mr. Mayor, Council yeah. Members, my name is Durham Lewis. I represent <laughs> Durham Lewis CPAs. We're the auditors for the Albemarle ABC Board. With your permission, I'd like to present the audit report for the year ended June 30th, 2024. Yes, sir. I would like to draw your attention to page one. The independent auditor's report should be the report that's uh, on letterhead. And for the record, I'd like to read the first paragraph into the record. We have audited the accompanying financial statements of Albemarle Board of Alcoholic Beverage Control, a component unit of the City of Albemarle, which comprised the statement of net position as of June 30, 24, and 23, 
and the related statements of revenue, expenses, and changes in net position, a statement of changes in cash flow for the years then ended, and the related notes to the financial statements. In our opinion, the accompanying financial statements present fairly, in all material respects, the financial position of the Albemarle Board of Alcoholic Beverage Control as of June 30, 2024 and 23, and the respective changes in financial position and cash flows for the years then ended in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. That paragraph indicates that I was able to render an unqualified opinion on the financial statements, the highest quality opinion uh, that an auditor can give, which means essentially I uh, found the books and records to be in fine shape and there were no uh, departures from generally accepted accounting principles. Thank you. If we could. Move forward to page seven. Page seven is the statement of net position, which those of you in the business world would call that a balance sheet. In the government world, it's a statement of net position. It shows the assets, liabilities, and net equity or net position of the board. As of June 30th, the board had 929,000 in cash, 714, 619 in inventory, plus prepaid for a total current assets of 1,655,846. Current liabilities, which are bills that are due and payable within the next business cycle, were 315,497, and net position was 2,269,835. The following page is the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position which in the business world, we would call that an income statement. It shows that gross sales for the year amounted to 5915 which is an increase of 200000 from the prior year. Taxes on gross sales were 1374 which is all mandated by state statute. Cost of sales was 3124 producing a net profit of 1416603 From that is deduct store expenses, warehouse, admin, and depreciation, plus non-operating revenues, which is interest earned, gives us a change in net position before distribution or net profit of 611,462. The board distributed 23,851 to law enforcement, 33,391 for alcohol education and rehabilitation programs, and 440,000 distribution to the city, leaving a net position of 2269000 The following statement is a statement of cash flows, which presents the cash received and cash spent <clears throat> by the board. And if we move forward into the notes to the financial statements, I'll draw your attention to page 13, <coughs> which contains a schedule listing the property, plant, and equipment <coughs> owned by the board and the depreciation. At year end, the board owned fixed assets of 1,577,508, which is an increase of 184,251 from the prior year. From that, of course, depreciation is subtracted. If I could draw your attention to page 14, in the middle of the page, there's a caption, Compliance with NC General Statutes. No instances of non-compliance with NC General Statute were noted during the completion of the audit. <coughs> you could turn to page 19. The bottom of page 19 contains a chart listing the distributions made by the ABC board to the city since inception. 440,000 made in the current year, 4,327 made from inception to date over the last 26 years. The 
The next page, page 20, shows the computation of the alcohol education and law enforcement distributions, which are mandated by statute to be 5 and 7 percent, respectively. And the board made the required distributions during the year. Taxes payable at the end of the year was 109508 which included sales tax, excise tax, county rehab tax, and mixed beverage taxes. The following page, page 21, gives detail on the various taxes. 13386 in county rehab taxes, 96744 in mixed beverage taxes, excise tax of 112000 Excuse me, uh, excise tax. The following page, page 22, middle of the page, uh, we have our working capital levels, which are mandated by state statute. The minimum working capital of the board is 292,000. Maximum is 1,903. The board's position was 1,327,401. They've met the minimum amount of working capital and have made distributions uh, in proper amounts so that they've not exceeded the maximum. <coughs> if you'll turn ahead to page 26, you'll see a schedule of store expenses which lists by line item the various store expenses incurred by the board. The following page is administrative expenses, which again list by line item the administrative expenses. Page 29 is detailed information on the various distributions made by the board during the year for law enforcement, alcohol education, and profit distributions to the town. And that's reconciled by beginning payable paid during the year and ending payable. And the final page is the schedule of budget to actual and the board operated within budget uh, for the year, which is also mandated by state statute. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to entertain any questions the board may have. Council? I just would like to say that the $4 million in 26, in 26 years to the city, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Um, and I think that we've got to, to uh, just to recognize that. Thank you very much to all the employees, and thank you to the board for what you've been doing. Uh, I think you're doing a great store, and uh, I think you've shown that year after year. Council, have any further questions or comments? Keep it up. I just noticed when their breakage and shrinkage was zero, nobody dropped a bottle over there all year. <laughs> Don't believe. say that now. Yeah, Look at Sylvia. Sylvia's shaking her head. They only dropped the plastic ones. So Sylvia is shaking her head. Over there in plastic. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. Great job. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Good job. Good job, guys. When he have, when he comes up to the up to the mic, I'm thinking it was just yesterday he did that last yes, year. I know like time <laughs> I know. Okay, I've got a uh, unannounced delegation, <laughs> and I'll try not to butcher the name, Yoselina Hamez, 345 Anderson Road. <laughs> you did, you she did wants well. To talk about it, uh, city ordinance, 92-123. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Yoselina Jaimez. I currently reside at 345 Anderson Road. Um, about a year ago, I started building my own house uh, located at 126 Lakeview Road within the city limits. Um, this is a single family home on an established neighborhood, not on a big developer backed by Chambers Engineering. Um, I'm almost done completing the house. Um, last week, I reached out to the city and um, asked for my CO. I was told that uh, before I got the CO, I needed to pay a sidewalk fee. Um, I was told that the sidewalk fee would be in the amount of $1,500. Um, I was a little confused, so I called the next day. 
spoke to um, the zoning department and they explained that the sidewalk fee is part of a fund for future sidewalks. Um, I was a little taken aback because I am in an established neighborhood, um, an older neighborhood, neighborhood in the city where I don't believe sidewalks will ever be built. Um, in fact, the home to the left of me um, their driveway eats right into my right of way, and then the home to my right has been abandoned for six or seven years and is up on auction right now. So the likelihood of a sidewalk ever being placed in front of my property is very slim. So um, obviously I was a little um, concerned with having to pay a $1,500 fee for a sidewalk that I probably won't see in my lifetime. Um, because of such, I would ask the city to consider possibly amending the ordinance to include a subsection um, that allows for existing developments um, from, being ex from being exempt from establishing that um, sidewalk where a sidewalk is not feasible. Um, I have pictures of the property if anyone is curious to see what it looks like currently. Um, Number two, another option that I would ask you consider is since I have to pay into the sidewalk fund, I would ask that the city council um, match that so that we can all contribute to that fund. Um, the last option and the one that I would prefer is that a one-time exemption be made for the property at 126 Lakeview Drive so that I do not have to uh, pay the sidewalk. And um, if 20, 25 years down the road, a sidewalk is ever established, I um, would be um, in a position to pay that. Um, I have photos of the property if anyone is willing to view those. Yes, ma'am, you can start them over here sure. and they'll pass them around. I will tell you that this is a policy ordinance that council adopted many years ago, and it has been in effect many times for many different residents. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does apply to existing neighborhoods. We did adopt uh, three years ago, roughly, maybe a little more, where you didn't have to build the sidewalk. You could actually pay a reduced fee that would go into the sidewalk mm -hmm. fund, and we would build sidewalk somewhere in the city based on where the, you know, that amount of money, was, enough was collected to build that amount of sidewalk. Mm -hmm. City provides all labor and all that, and do we do put cash with it when we need to, but it was designed to help the the, build, the uh, property owner to pay a little less, but still require a sidewalk on all these big developments, like we were talking about tonight. Correct. They will have to put sidewalks. Absolutely, down. I see. So that. it's, it's kind of hard to say. Well, you're going to build one for these houses, but you don't have to build one for this house. When you're changing the footprint of the house, is when we make you make you pay it. And so, council has had this request the time mm -hmm. before. And I think I can pretty much tell you they're not going to give you any any kind of a, an exemption because we've not done it to anybody else. We can't set a precedent now, mm -hmm. but all these other people have paid theirs. What what percent is it of the cost? Isn't it? It's actually based on the cost of this. Robbins, come on up. So the way it works is um, is we, we do as the mayor said we do require sidewalks on both sides of the street on all new development um, over 10 lots. Anything under 10 lots or commercial, uh, you do have the option to either put the sidewalk in yourself um, or to pay um, into the sidewalk uh, funds. Um, it is, what we do is we use the kind of the going rate. We contact the public works director uh, about that. Uh, right now it's probably gonna go up a little bit, but we're still using a $25 a linear foot rate. Um, and then we, we reduce, we take out driveways from that we take out if you've got a huge piece of property you know it's 200 feet minimum that's not being developed we would take that out we look at just the areas developed take out the driveways and then it's whatever the linear foot is times 25 whatever the total is you multiply that times 75 percent so it's a 25 percent discounted rate since you're not putting them in on the property yourself and and most i would say probably 95 percent of all the new homes that we've had on existing lots have utilized the, the fee in the ordinance. So is that fifteen hundred dollars is is that the reduced rate or was that yes. that's the re, that's the reduced I, rate? I, I don't know the case, but um, it sounds like it, if that's the final number that you would give them it should be the reduced rate, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, let me just say this, and and for those of you who have been on council or <laughs> been familiar with this, I, I'm I agree uh, in this situation. I know that something has to be done if it's a new development. If we're putting in a brand new neighborhood, it makes good sense in my mind that we put sidewalks and we have that developer put those sidewalks in. Uh, in my own neighborhood, we had the same topic come up probably about a year and a half ago, and it's a 40 plus, 40, 50 plus year old neighborhood. We had somebody come before council that was building a new house, and we gave them the opportunity to either pay the fee or put a sidewalk in. Well, it's kind of in my mind, and I'm just going to say as blunt as I can, the homeowner's in a kind of a catch-22. Either they put a sidewalk in, and it's a sidewalk of nowhere, because mm -hmm. to the to the resident's point, it's most likely never going to be completely, it's, gonna, it's never going to connect anywhere. So, I, I mean, me personally, I wish we could look at, as a as a city, if we're gonna if we're gonna do this, uh, I get business districts. I understand that. I don't get the one offs in an established neighborhood like she's talking about, making them pay an additional fifteen hundred dollars, or put a sidewalk in. Either she's coming out fifteen hundred dollars, or she has to put a sidewalk nowhere in front of her house. I mean, she's gonna be giving people directions to her house. Yep, I'm the only house in the neighborhood that has a sidewalk. I don't think that looks good aesthetically. I don't think. I just, I mean, I just don't think it makes good sense. I know that, I think we have some neighboring municipalities, um, and I will double check. I think we have neighboring municipalities in Cabarrus County that do require this uh, ordinance in business districts, but not in residential, unless it's a new <coughs> residential neighborhood. Again, I just don't, I, me personally, I'm just one of seven. I don't see the sense in requiring uh, a sidewalk to nowhere or excessively charging a new a, a resident on a new construction home. I'm, I'll never see it, so. And, and once again, I'm not backed by a big developer. This is just me. So just I would like to, to e I echo those comments because I didn't I mean when it, that might have been not 18 months ago, it might have been longer than that over in Lafayette, okay? But I don't like the idea of a sidewalk to nowhere as well. Um, but we we have got to, we can't make, in my opinion, we can't make exceptions right now. We've either got to look at it and change it if we're going to do that because we didn't make an exception then in that 50-year-old neighborhood, and your neighborhood is about that it's age. About the same. I mean, there's you know, we just can't do that, okay? However, again, it goes back to what the committee that Kevin's got working right now. We need to look at a lot of different things, and that's something I think they can look at question I'd have on the sidebar is, and Kevin, this may not be a fair question, but if we've got the fund for sidewalks to nowhere, is that an escrow somewhere? Do we know is, Do we know how much money we got there in that fund? Uh, we would have to, um, we would have to um, get those numbers for you. We have five different funds. There's five districts. <coughs> They're broken down in districts so that while they may not go directly to your house, your funds are going to be spent relatively close to your property, right? Um, commercial, residential, what have you. Um, you set up with that. Um, they, they vary. We've got one right now. Uh, I'm working with the new engineer. We're trying to get some plans for a, a, a relatively long sidewalk utilizing the funds. And I think it's District 4 right now. Um, there's over $100,000, $120,000 there. Uh, last time I looked, it will be going towards that. Um, others are just accruing, waiting until we can get enough to do um, some more of those projects. Um, we have used them in um, Park West, um, some small gaps there. I um, believe we used it over on um, Leonard to connect some small gaps there. So we've got some smaller projects, but we're really trying to get some larger projects to spend these on. Um, to, to the <coughs> thing about the, the, the old versus new, um, really we were, I mean, there's, there's not a good answer. I understand completely where, you know, some of council's coming from on it, um, but at the same time, we're requiring uh, new homes being built in these new subdivisions to put in sidewalks on both sides. Um, and really, it's 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 more of an equitable thing to say that okay, when a structure's built, if there's nothing there, then those would be installed at that time. And that's really why we went with that. Yeah. But then also realizing that you know that the sidewalk to nowhere may not be wanted. The you know. Um, the fact that it wouldn't be right in front of your property right away, that's why the um, we incentivized it with the 75% uh, reduction. Yeah, I, I get that, but the, the, the resident before us tonight, she challenged all the council 
to that she would be willing to pay the fifteen hundred dollars if we would match it. And at the end of the day, even if we accepted that challenge, not one of us will walk out of that out of this room feeling good about it. Because while I appreciate the fact that we do have this fund that you know that that builds sidewalks and other parts of town, it's of no benefit to her. And we pay enough in, in my mind, we pay enough in taxes. And again, I get I get the new construction, I get the new neighborhoods when you're putting sidewalks in on both sides. I completely understand that. I completely understand business districts. I will never understand in a 40, 50 year old neighborhood making this lady, making anybody pay additional money for a sidewalk to nowhere or a sidewalk to be built somewhere on the other side of town that she's never gonna be able to use. I just don't see it. And I, I don't think any of us would disagree with what you're saying. And but you know, it's sort of a catch of 22 to some degree. And, uh, well, the mayor, the mayor, mayor pro tem you know, brought it, up, it, we it, need it, to either look at the ordinance and potentially maybe make a change or, I mean, that's an option. Well, I when, mean, when your land use plan is meeting and I think they have meeting. a public meeting coming up, yeah. uh, oh, is that the 19th, Kevin? I want to say it's David, David's saying it, yes. It's, it's, it's coming up on the 19th, and I, I mean, I, I do think some of these <clears throat> things are items that the steering committee could look at, um, but I would just caution that uh, they're not going to be able to get into a whole bunch of detailed ordinance items um, on this as well. They may, you know, they may, there will be some goals that come out of this, and we can look at um, ordinances uh, changes afterwards, but um, they're going to be looking kind of at the, the broad, big, big picture stuff on that. So just to keep, keep that in mind. I, I share your concerns, Councilmember Aldridge. I remember the, those are the <clears> terms, come, phrases coming up, sidewalks to nowhere, when right. the Honda dealership was right. adding on oh. their used car parking lot. And, <laughs> and that's when this whole issue surfaced probably set about four or five years ago. Yep. So, yeah, it's definitely worth revisiting as a council. Yes, it is. So last question I would have, and I appreciate <clears throat> you bringing this up, because I would ask to Kevin, um, come on back up because you brought up an interesting point the petitioner has that you're about finished with your house and you went in for a CO. Yeah. Madam so just a question, why is it that it got to that point before you realized that, I mean, you were finished with, you had all these other, you went through the permitting and all that kind of thing. Why is it? And I, somebody needs to help me understand that. Were you your own general contractor? You were. Bless you. So I, I, under, I understand that. Um, and um, our staff does their best to tell everybody about this stuff. Uh, we have made some changes. There are supposed to be some disclaimers on the, um, the coordination form now. I'm not sure if you got an old one or a new one. But there's some disclaimers on there that make those statements and everything. So... That's supposed, that's supposed to be a checklist item that's covered with everybody when they come From through. whom? From my department on a coordination form. When you come in and get your coordination form before you go to the county to get your building permits, that stuff's supposed to be covered. Um, you know, it's, it, I apologize if it wasn't, but that's something we've been working very hard to make sure that everybody knows that stuff ahead of time. There's several items that have to be gone over uh, with them. Um, and um, so... so so when did so you said you went to get your CO and that's when you found out about it? So I I guess and when you made the comment, Kevin, that you might have gotten an old form or a new form, I think I don't I, I, I don't know when I don't know when, when she this got was it. applied for right. or anything like that. Right. And I don't even know I'm not even sure exactly what the address is on this. And I haven't talked with my staff about it that are responsible for this either, so I really can't tell you. I understand because she. This was an add-on. This was yeah, and I understand that this is, um, but I guess that just that brings up a red flag to me because I. I mean, as a, being your own general contractor, I commend you, but oh my goodness, uh, and I guess that that might have been that part of it too. But I guess I'm just concerned that it got done, and it, that's when she found out about it. That's when did sorry. When did you start the process? I can't confirm that. I, I would, I would need to make sure of that. Thanks. When? A year ago. So, Kevin, will you do that? Will you check for her and just... Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. happy to look into it. Yeah. I mean, it's... I, it's, I just... Yeah, I mean, we, we've run you. into this before where, where, you know, they have been told, and I'm not saying you, you may have been overlooked, but we've run into this before where they have been told, and it does 
end up getting to the time for the CO and it's, you know, this hasn't been taken care of yet. So, um, but I'll, I'll check, check with uh, Charles on that. I'm sure he's Thank probably you. the one that issued it. Um, potentially Brad, I'll, I'll see what they, uh, what they say about it. I, I, I'd appreciate that. The Thank issue you. would still be the same, but you know, it's, you know, we do want to make sure you know about it. Thank you, Ms. Hamez. Uh, council will consider that as we're looking through the process of the land use plan. Thank you very much. But right now we cannot uh, issue a exemption of any kind. Thank you. Council, your monthly department reports are in your agenda. Question or comment? Your municipal calendar is in your agenda. Uh, get a couple of things on that on the minute rip on the calendar. Um, I've got them somewhere. Hang tight a minute. So is it scheduled, Todd, the twelfth of November? Is yes, that yes, ma'am. Okay, so that probably needs to be added. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that. Um, and just for clarification for the city council, what she's referring to is strategic planning meeting called special meeting of the city council, November twelfth. And exact time is to be determined, but that date is here. And that, that probably at E.E. Waddell? Yes, ma'am. It'll okay. be a late afternoon, early evening meeting. Okay. Thank you so much. And do we already have a place for the 26th meeting of, of the COG that we are hosting? I'll, I'll handle that. <coughs> we were looking at five. Okay. I was going to suggest that. <laughs> Thank you. Moving to the consent agenda, consider a petition of annexation properties on Poplins Grove Church Road. Council members, this is to set a public hearing on November the 18th. So moved. Second. I assume that Motion. June 17th was just a typo. That's well, an, it looks to me like they used an old form and didn't okay. correct it because remember this company, this group came before yeah. us and then canceled at the last minute now they've rescheduled it okay. i think it's got two different dates in there but it's november the 18th, 18th. uh motion by council member hall second by council member dry further discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed motion carried unfinished business consider approval of the road closures for the 2024 albemarle christmas parade i think we left it with some questions last time and uh, i've heard nothing back so Mr. Clark, who's going to handle that? Yes, thank you, Mayor. J.T. Cranford as well as tonight with the police department. <laughs> J.T., if you'll give us an update, please. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. There were some questions brought up about the consideration for the road closure uh, for the 2024 Christmas parade. Uh, you should have a map in your agenda uh, for this evening. We met with the risk safety coordinator with the city and other staff to discuss uh, the planning of the Christmas parade and the out of, and the lineup location. Um, the, the recommendation of the group um, to get the cut back on traffic issues and congestion around the YMCA pavilion before and after the parade uh, was to find another lineup location. Uh, that lineup location was selected for the Stanley County Commons uh, with agreement with the county commissioner, I'm sorry, county manager. And uh, we're, the plan was to line up the parade floats uh, that are driving in the parade at that location. Uh, police will escort them from that location through to the start of the parade, which is at the YMCA Pavilion uh, there on First Street, where we will pick up the walking groups, uh, the bands, any other kind of walking gymnastics or whatever is going to be walking in the parade will be staged at the YMCA Pavilion. We'll continue down the parade route back to the end uh, where the walking groups will exit the lineup and the police will then escort the parade from that location back to the commons. So you're not showing now, so you're not going to go close to the closing first street from Salisbury to Queenby Mile or commons? It will be police escorted from the okay. commons Same through. thing on 2nd Street. No, Same not thing on 2nd Street, yes. Okay. There will so, be an officer at both locations at both intersections. So what scares me is that police escort, you think, I mean, let's just be real. There might be 50, I don't know, 50 non-walking entries. And you've got 
from the startup, they'll basically all get, they'll all get on the floats and that kind of thing at the commons. And I can see that escort because you're just going to get them up to in front of the YMCA at the corner and then everybody will mesh in. I can see that. Right. That's not going to be a problem. But what I see is a cluster coming back out of there when you've got <laughs> three floats marching, 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 three cars, people, 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 and you've got police escorts getting back. Is that not going to be a, a use of a lot of... I, I don't understand the, how with the number of police officers and the number of police officers that are already going to be at different intersections holding back people, how we're going to have the manpower to do all of that back. To, and I don't understand that logistically, but it just seems like to me that a lot. So normally, like for instance, last year, the lead car in the parade, uh, once the parade came back through and got to the YMCPV and the lead car did depart from the parade. Um, this year, that lead car will lead the escort to Salisbury in second. We can exit the walking groups back off out of the line, mm -hmm. and then it will be, in turn, taken to Stanley Commons. All right, where are the riders for these floats going to get on the floats at? At the Commons or once you come down near the YMCA? At the Commons. All right, so they've got to go back up to the Commons, up 2nd Street. Correct. And it's you're not going to have the streets closed for that? If I look at the street, I was speaking with Joy. I believe the street closure is for temporary for that area. I could so you're incorrect. going to temporarily close it? <laughs> temporarily close so it until we get the, the float back. So you're going to have streets where they're going Correct. to. Correct. Correct. Okay, see, last time wasn't going to close 2nd Street at all. <laughs> okay. There will be an officer there at 2nd and Salisbury and 2nd and 1st to let the parade escort into the lineup, into the area, uh, past 1st and Salisbury. There will be another officer at the... Second Salisbury, when we get ready to leave that area, to, we escort them back to the uh, commons. What are you going to have between Second Salisbury and the commons? Another officer there if we need one there at Yakin Street. Why are we making the change? Uh, we have a <laughs> lot of traffic congestion uh, last year. Every year in the last three years, we've increased the number of floats for the parade. I believe last year it was just over 100, 102, 103 floats. Not not float. No, not float. Entries. Sorry, entries. entries. There's Correct. yeah. I'm three sorry. floats. I'm sorry. Correct. 103. Yeah. 102 or so entries into the parade. Uh, there was also five professional floats last year. Um, this will allow for more space for the lineup location. It will also cut back on any kind of congestion, confusion, or anything at the start of the parade and at the finishing of the parade. Have but we again, had those issues previously? <laughs> When it was 50 to 65 entrants, no. Um, as the entries have grown, those issues have been more prevalent. Council, what's your wishes? Well, so, Mayor, I got a question. So, so the praise will end where it normally does right there in front of the funeral home, is that right? <laughs> Correct. This will also allow for further expansion should we get more entrance next year and the year after. And so are the as the as the participants get off the floor, are they just gonna walk back to the commons? Is that only the walking groups will get out of the procession at that time? No as I understand it, Bill, everybody that started from the commons will go back. Will go back to the commons on whatever vehicle that they are on. And that was my concern. That's this is the way it's been proposed. The other time it was brought. But my concern is, is how are we going to get from the corner of the funeral home all the way back to the commons if it's police, if it says police escort, <laughs> how are we going to get it? Because it's not all, I mean, we they won't all be together because there'll be ride, 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 walk, walk, ride. I mean, they'll just, it'll all be broken up. I just, I don't understand how that's going to happen with manpower. <coughs> well, I just think about the, I think about the safety aspect of it when you've got these floats with, uh, you know, they're, I think, I think riding through a parade is, is one thing, especially when you have smaller kids. 
but when you're coming down the hill and sack it, heading back to the commons, I just don't want there to be any kind of a safety issue. It will be a slow moving escort from there up to the commons for the traffic officers around the area. Make it work. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the road closures. Second. Motion by Council Member Whitley, second by Council Member Drive to approve the Christmas parade route and road closures. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Clark, would you like to introduce our <coughs> police chief? Yes, Mayor. I would appreciate that opportunity. I'll, I'll ask Penny Dunn, our interim police chief, to come forward. Just to be recognized tonight. <clears throat> Penny, thank you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Just, uh, I'll read just a little bit of background on Penny. She started her law enforcement career in 1986 with Friendswood, Texas Police Department. She moved to San Marcos, Texas Police Department in 1989. Graduated from Texas State University and after spending 31 years in Texas law enforcement, she moved to Davidson, North Carolina in July of 20. 17 to become chief of police. Her experience in law enforcement work includes uh, several areas, including being assistant chief of police, administration division. She was a commander in three or four divisions of the department, she spent time in the criminal investigation division, the day shift and specialized unit command, and the night shift and canine unit command. She was a sergeant in patrol and criminal investigations divisions a detective in CID and narcotics, um, <clears throat> and also a two-year assignment to the DEA Austin Federal Task Force. And as everyone else, she started as a patrol officer. So those are just uh, some <coughs> of her career highlights. Um, Penny, anything that you'd like to add? Uh, no, sir. I'm just glad to be here. I'm looking forward to working with everyone, and I've started meeting some of the uh, folks, nearly all of them so far, at the Albemarle, excuse me, Albemarle Police Department. And it looks like you have a fine group of people, and I think we can do a lot together. Penny, thank Good. you very much. We appreciate you stepping in here with short notice. Counseling, any comments for Penny? Welcome aboard. Welcome. 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 I'll thank just you comment, Mayor and Council, we are starting the recruitment process for a permanent position uh, this week. And Penny has publicly stated that she is not a candidate <laughs> ready to retire. <laughs> Penny, thank you. I appreciate Thank you your very help. much. Thank, thank you very you much. Penny. Thank you. Anything else come before council? No, sir. Anyone else have anything to come before council? I'll entertain a motion that we adjourn until our next regular scheduled meeting on Monday, November the 5th at 6 30. November 4th. Oh, is it 4th? Yes. Okay. okay. November 4th at 6 30 p.m. So moved. moved. Motion by Council Member Dry. Second. Second by Council Member Whitley. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. All right. Those opposed?